Hello, welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for being with us today. The sermon title today is The Unity of God, Our Triune God in Us. Let me repeat that. The Unity of Our Triune God in Us. You know, what is unity? We all desire to have unity in our lives, but how do we express it? Unity comes from God's triune nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, they have perfect unity through their love for one another, and this unity gives them the oneness that they are, three persons in one. In Jesus Christ, we are included in their oneness and their unity. Let's notice over in Psalms 133 where the psalmist describes unity in such a graphic way. It's uh, really uh, appropriate to start out the message with Psalms 133 verse 1. How good and pleasant it is when pe God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil, which would be a reference to the Holy Spirit today, poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So it goes to show that the unity comes from God and it has a relationship quality with God for eternity. So the unity we have is in God for eternity. And that's the way God has designed it for us to be able to participate in it. So he pours out his spirit on us today and in Christ's name we receive it. The Apostle Paul describes God's unity in us through his spirit over in Ephesians the fourth chapter. So let's go over to Ephesians 4 and notice how the Apostle Paul describes unity today in our current living. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, Paul said, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So these are qualities of God's love and how the Spirit leads us. Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So the Spirit of unity helps us to have the peace that we're looking for in our living. Even when times aren't going the best for us, if we have the Spirit moving in our minds and hearts, we have the peace of God. In verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. In verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So in the Spirit of God, we have all of these expressions of God's nature, His nature of love. And His nature of love gives us unity and it gives us His peace. It comes from God. Unity comes from God. Peace joy, all the fruits of the Spirit, all the fruits we enjoy come from God. And we are the recipients through Jesus Christ today. And also in Jesus Christ, we are one body. We are one body of the church. So we have to appreciate that if the church wants to be the one body that we are, with Jesus being the head, we have to be under the direction and the unity of Jesus Christ himself. And so, over in 1 Corinthians 12, we see Paul talking about that in several scriptures here. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So the thing that unites us in unity is the spirit God gives us. You know, at Pentecost, uh, beginning of the church, we all received the Holy Spirit who was poured out upon us. And so ever since that, the church has been held together and has had unity through the spirit who indwells us and so we're blessed to have that relationship that God has given to us. So in verse uh, 14, 
Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So we have many parts in the body. We're not all the same, but we all have the same spirit. The spirit is what unifies us and helps us to see the need of everyone in the body. So we don't put one part of the body over the other. We're all equal in value, even our parts that are hidden. They are as valuable as all the parts that are visible. So we have to appreciate how God in Christ has given us that oneness in the body of the church. Down in verse 18 then, of 1 Corinthians 12, it says, But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. He knows what each part of the body is to express and the value it has. And we have to be confident in that. In that. In verse 19, if they were all one part, where would the body be? It'd be just disjointed. It wouldn't be able to function. And sometimes the body of Jesus gets disjointed. and He has to help get it together again so we can all work through the inspiration of the one spirit who guides us. As it is, there are many parts but one body. In verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And how true that is, we come to understand about our internal organs. If they're not working correctly, our whole body's going to go down. It can't even stand up, let alone do anything. So we recognize that even though we can't see the obvious value of a part of the body, we better start looking and see why it's valuable. Because as we get into these end times where we're going to be preparing the way for Jesus' second coming, we need to be doing our job and being the oneness that we are in Him and expressing His love fully to all those around us. So, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And that's the thing that really shows the oneness of the body with Christ as the head. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has given or put together the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So true unity is described in that way. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That's true unity in a family, in a workplace, in the church, wherever it is. So you know when you're, you're unified because that's what happens. In other words, that's the expression of love in the unit involved, in this case, the body, the church. So in Jesus Christ, we have access to our Father by one Spirit. And uh, the Apostle Paul mentions that over in Ephesians 2. So if you'll turn there with me, if you have your Bibles. I'm reading from the NIV version. Ephesians 2 and verse 11. Therefore, Paul says, remember that formerly you were who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, of course referring to the Jewish nation. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. So there was no unity at all. That's a description of non-unity right there. So Jesus stepped in. He stepped into the world, became a human being who is fully man and fully God. He died on the cross and He rose from the dead so we could have unity and be reconciled as the human race. In verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In verse 14, For He Himself is our peace. See, when we're unified, we have peace. Without unity, we don't have peace. We don't have peace in the world because we don't have unity. We're just kind of cobbled together as nations of the world, hoping that someone doesn't tip something over and cause a conflagration of some kind. 
So we need the peace of Jesus, and He's already given it to us if we will receive it. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier. See, yes, he, he destroyed the barrier of non-unity, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. In other words, we become that new creation and we express his love like he expresses his love to us. In verse 16, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The answer to you uh, being united is spiritual in nature. In verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So Jesus, through his message of his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, he preached it. And now we minister it today because we have received his reconciliation and we need to minister to others with it. We need to give our testimony of it. So in verse 18, For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Everybody has access to the Father. Our Father through one Spirit. We have access to Jesus through the Spirit. We have access to the Spirit through the Spirit. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. For unified as members of His household, built, see, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, all of the testament of God, old and new alike, with Christ Jesus Himself, the chief cornerstone, and in Him the whole building is joined together See, unified and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So that's who we are today as one, unified in Him through the Spirit. And of course, we have the Spirit living in us too. Therefore, our own bodies are a temple of the Spirit. The church is a temple of the Spirit. The household of God is a temple of the Spirit of God to where we all come together in unity and that will be the wonderful world tomorrow when that will be fully expressed. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. So we see that Jesus has given us the answer, and so at times in human history, we come together more than other times. Right now, we're kind of scattered. You know, we're not really connected well. So it's only those who know Jesus and receive the good news that we've been reconciled in Him that we can express the unity that we have and pray for others who we see need it. And then the kingdom of heaven on earth, the kingdom of light as it's called, can be advanced. Well, here we are still working with being united in Jesus and also being united with our Father. And of course it comes through the Spirit as we've said today. Over in John 17, we see Jesus himself describe this beautiful relationship as it is today for us who believe and for those who do not believe that it's right there at the door for them to enter in. In John 17, John 17 verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone, referring to his disciples at the time, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message and therefore through our message today that all of them may be one Father just as you are in me and I am in you. Now that is perfect unity right there. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So if we recognize that he lives in us and we live in him and therefore we're one with God in the Spirit, then the world will believe that the Father sent him to us. In verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Can't get any tighter than that. You say, Lord, you go, I'll follow. You lead, I'll go where you go. I'm yours because he has made himself ours. He invested in us to be one with him for eternity. 
in verse 23, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So that God the Father, through the Spirit's indwelling and the unity He gives us, makes us realize that He loves us as much as He loves Jesus. See, there's no disparity in unity. There's no up and down. There's all inclusion. Inclusion is what unity is in God's purview. So what a wonderful relationship that God has brought us into. So having the mind of Jesus Christ, which is what we should all want to do, because He is the perfect example of God's love for us, and that's mentioned over in Philippians 2, too, we can glorify our Father with one voice. That's found over in Romans, Romans the 15th chapter. Romans 15 and verse 5. Also, Paul is talking about this in such a beautiful way. So Romans 15, 5, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement, see, and we all need that, don't we, from time to time, endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. In verse 6, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, what Jesus says, if we do, whatever we do and ask in His name that glorifies the Father, that He will do. So Paul is saying, if we have the same mind as Jesus, and our voice is given in support of that, that it glorifies the God the Father, see, then we are in a perfect relationship, and, uh, and it's the best of all things that we can enjoy today. In verse 7, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promise made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And he is confirming his relationship with all humanity today through you and me. So since we are members of one body, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. It says it over in Colossians. Colossians 3, verse 5. Colossians 3, verse 15, I mean. Colossians 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. So being thankful is the best way to express the peace of God in our hearts. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. So as we share our testimony of being reconciled in Christ, we can do it through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. In verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So let's make every effort this coming week to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So if you'll please join with me in prayer. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that we can gather together today and talk about your unity you've given to us in your precious Son, Jesus' holy name. You sent him to us because you loved us and you wanted us to not be condemned but saved and to have a relationship with you for eternity. And here we are, dear God. We're unified with you through the Spirit. And we ask and pray you'll help us to speak the words of peace that we might be able to help not only ourselves but those we associate with and those we see need your peace that they would be able to receive it too through our own testimony in whatever way you work that out. We submit our lives to you. We ask and pray that we can be ministers of reconciliation and express our testimony of that wonderful relationship. So we are so thankful for the unity you've given to us in all the ways you have, and especially in the body of the church. And we ask and pray you'll bless the church, that you as the head of the church will have the church 
who will be your bride when you come back the second time, that the church can prepare your way. And we thank you, dear God, that we can do it together, lifting people up in the body, helping people who need help to receive help. We thank you and we ask your blessing in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all together we say, Amen. Amen.